begin the chapter dealing with waves, waves on strings, such as guitar strings, piano wires, as well as sound waves. Let's first talk about waves on strings. I show what was once the location of a string that was not vibrating. The broken line shows where the string was. We then shape this into the string at a certain frequency, up and down. The symbol for frequency is F, and it's the number of shakes per second, the number of oscillations or vibrations per second that occur. Peaks and valleys appear along the length of the string, a maximum there and there, a minimum there and there. The distance between consecutive maxima is called the wavelength of the string, the wavelength of the string wave. It's the same as the distance between consecutive minima, consecutive valleys. I outline in red one full sine wave. That's the same distance as the same length as the distance between consecutive peaks. This distance there is a wavelength, same as that distance is a wavelength, and that distance is a wavelength. The peaks and valleys propagate down the length of the string until they meet a barrier, which will put in the way of this wave later. These pulses travel down the length of the string at a certain speed v called the wave speed. The wave speed is a calculatable quantity. It it's determined by the mass of the string measured in standard units of kilograms and the length of the string measured in standard international units for distance, meters. The ratio of the mass per length is called the linear mass density. It's symbolized as mu, the Greek letter lowercase for m, reminds you of the first letter of the word mass. So the linear mass density is m divided by l. We earlier encountered f, the symbol for the frequency of oscillation of this string which is the same as what we call the frequency of the wave, measured in hertz. A hertz is equivalent to a reciprocal second, or the phrase per second. S to the negative one power is a hertz. Now, another important property of the string that determines how it will behave is the tension in the string, symbolized as T. Without proof, I declare that the speed of the wave, which is the speed of individual pulses, you can call them, is the square root of the tension divided by the linear mass density. The all-important wave equation appears in this box. It's the same equation that we use for sound waves, water waves, and in a later chapter, electromagnetic waves. It's a string wave equation. Once the mass and length and tension are determined, and therefore the speed is fixed once and for all for various situations, you can see that the higher the frequency of oscillation, the smaller will be the wavelength and vice versa. The product of the two numbers, lambda and frequency, is the same. And that product is the speed of the wave, which does not change unless you change the tension in the string or change the mu, either by changing the mass or the length. All right, let's look at an example in which the wave that is traveling to your right encounters a barrier, a wall, which I show here. This is where the string, how the string would be aligned if it were not being oscillated at this left end. Shaking that string at this left end 
over small amounts can cause a rather dramatic behavior elsewhere along the length of the string. I show here what the string wave would look like as it propagates to the right, bounces off the clamp at the left or the wall at the left, and you have a reflected ray encountering a ray traveling to the right. Under just the right condition, that is to say, at just the right frequency, what could happen is a so-called resonance, a magnification occurs. The bottom line is this. For this particular situation, we have this string oscillating back and forth like this. It's a blur. It happens so fast, maybe 50, 60 times per second, or maybe much more slowly. The string is not simultaneously there and up there, of course. I just mean to indicate that it's doing this. And while this is going on, when this is going up, this is coming down. So we have this kind of behavior. Same thing is happening for the other, what I call loops. So this is called a one, two, three, four loop standing wave. It's called a standing wave because the string appears to be standing still. Well, at least these points are standing still. Let me explain these points there labeled N, 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 and N, and I won't label that N because it's not strictly speaking what I will now define to be a node. A node along a length of a wave is a place where there's no movement of the string. No movement, node. So there is a node there, 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 and there. In such a case, we have a right to call this wave a standing wave. We say that this wave or this string is resonating. Now, in between places that are nodes, here, 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 and there, there is an antinode. An antinode is the opposite of a node. It's a place along the length of the string where there's maximum movement. Maximum movement here is an antinode, and as I said before, while this is going up, this is coming down. So it's this behavior here. So we could describe this standing wave, this resonant situation, as a four-loop standing wave, where I describe these objects there as loops, not a technical term. This is a standing wave with four Antinodes, so we could describe this standing wave, this resonant situation, as a four antinode resonance. Now, let's look at it in greater depth. Let me point out to you that the distance between this point and that point is one of these sine waves, a full wavelength that I spoke of before. This distance is a full wavelength. And half of that distance is a half of a loop width, a loop width. Here's one loop width, two, three, and four loop widths. Each loop width is a half of the red length, half of a wavelength, lambda over two. It's very important for you to remember that throughout this discussion in this chapter of string waves, a loop width is a half lambda length half lambda. Now suppose the length of the string that's stretched between these two points is two meters. This end of the string is being oscillated. Now I have a right to label that point there an N for node, even though it is moving, because in order to cause a resonance with wild behavior over here, only a small bit of oscillation is required there, so little oscillation, so little movement of the left end of the string, that for all practical mathematical purposes, we can speak of it as being a node. So you could, if you wish, label that point a node. Well, suppose, as I said, the length of the string is two meters. Now, at any given instant of time, the string is stretched along that path there. Certainly, the length of the string that would be stretched along that path is greater than the length of a string that's stretched straight line between those two points. But it will be always the case that the amplitude, that's the amount of departure from the, the zero movement, 
of our wave is small enough compared to the length of the string that we may treat the length of the string L as being equal to the sum of the many loop widths. This loop width plus that plus that plus that equals the total length of the string. This is a critical observation, so I'll repeat it. In your calculations, which will come in the future, in your determinations of the special frequencies F that will cause a standing wave, only certain frequencies will work, as you will see, you will assume that the sum of the loop widths equals the length of the string. Say it again. The sum of all of the lambda over 2s equals the length L of the string. This distance plus that plus that and that, four of those, equals 2. Now, let's see what we can determine based on that sum of loop widths equals L rule. The sum of loop widths equals L rule. We start with the wave equation, the all-important wave equation. The product of the wavelength and the frequency is the speed. Well, if we know the speed of our wave and also the wavelength of the standing wave that will be created, we can calculate the value of the middle term, the frequency. Let's leave that equation and come upstairs here to an example problem. Suppose we're told that the speed of our wave, as determined by this equation long already forgotten, is given to us in its 4 meters per second. We now invoke the rule that I repeated two or three times that the sum of the loop widths, the sum of the lambda over 2s, equals the length L. Well, we have four such loop widths in this particular example, each having a width of lambda over 2. Four times that equals the length of the string. Solve this equation for lambda, and you get 1 meter for the wavelength. Now let's come back to this. Put 1 meter for the wavelength lambda. F is what we wish to determine. V is stated as 4. Solve this equation for f, and you get 4 reciprocal seconds, which is 4 hertz. What have we learned? We've learned for this particular string whose wave speed is 4 meters per second, and whose length is 2 meters, that the frequency that will cause a 4 antinode standing wave, say it a different way, the frequency will cause a 4 loop standing wave, a 4 antinode standing wave is 4 hertz. If we wish to determine the frequency that would cause a 5 loop, 6 loop, 7 loops, 2 loops, 10 loop standing wave, we would repeat a calculation similar to this. Quite straightforward. In our next lecture, we probably will see one more example of this sort of calculation. I hope this is, I hope this made some sense to you. If not, of course, you know what you can do. You can replay the video. I hope what I showed you was clear enough and you understood most of what I've said. But you never know.